Church of the Crossing here in Alito. Uh, if you if you want to come uh, see one of these sessions here at the, at the Church of the Crossing here in Alito, uh, just come on in Thursday night uh, at this time. Please get here just a few minutes early. Pull in the north parking lot. Look down the hallway. And there's an open door to the left. It's real simple. Just come on in and you'll see us. Church. Uh, and we're currently... 14. I think we're on chapter 14 now. Um, and that's on Wednesday nights. Get here at 5.30. From 5.36, we fellowship and eat uh, pizza. <laughs> and then at 6 o'clock till 6.45, we study, and then we pray at that time. Um, and there, if you're wanting to come in with a women's study, then, then you can contact them. There's a women's study upstairs. There's a First Peter study across the hallway and a marriage study behind us where it's husband and wife team. And there is child care for the Wednesday night, not the Thursday night. But children are welcome, but you're responsible uh, if you bring them here, okay? Let's go ahead and pray in because we got a lot to talk about. Father, thank you for this time together. Your blessings, your mercy, your grace, we ask that you would please give us the wisdom through your Holy Spirit on what to understand and what to speak and what to hear. And we ask for the, the blessings and protection of Israel. We ask for the healing of our nation to give us a, another great awakening in this country. We ask these things in the name of our Messiah, Jesus Christ, Yeshua. Amen. Okay, real quick. Um, I'm going to stop in saying this. We as Christians, I'm talking to my Christian friends. If you're not a Christian, you can put your fingers in your ears if you want to. I'm, and I'm being silly. We are to be watchers on the wall. We are to be guards on the wall. We're commanded. So if you see something coming and, and, the, guard, and the, the, the guard doesn't say anything, then if something happens, it's his fault, his or her fault. But if they say something, then it warns the other people. Our job as Christians is to are to warn people. We have in our mainstream churches, Methodists, all the other ones, almost all the main denominations are now pro-evolution, meaning God didn't create everything or he started it. And the, the for instance, uh, there's several of them that say, well, God started it and let it go for millions and millions of years. The problem is God said, I created everything in six days. Uh, six literal 24-hour days. And if God had to have help and time, that means he's not all-powerful. So either you believe that he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present and all everywhere in the universe. That's the God we worship. If you believe in, in a different God, that's, a, that's not the God of the Bible. Why is this important? Because our kids come from Christian homes, uh, whatever your denomination is, 75 to 88%. So between, according to the, the Pew Research and the uh, Barnum study, we are losing over, so around at least 80% of our kiddos the first year of college. Why? Because they go in there and they have ungodly professors for the most part going to secular colleges. And even I'm like, there's colleges here that have Christian in their name and there's nothing Christian about it. Not anymore. And the thing is, the professors who are evolutionists and atheists and humanists, and they've been indoctrinated our children. Uh, you're to pray. I mean, you can't guard them. 20, you can't guard your kids 24 hours a day. But what you can do is you can, when you're raising them, is to teach them and prepare them for this. There are different methods to be able to train them with the knowledge. And then they have to make their own decision once they get out. You can go to the different sides, like. Um, uh, answers in Genesis. Uh, there's even a local, there's a creation evidence museum, CEM. You can go there. Even in our local area, there's a there's a creation museum over here in Glen Rose. Uh, Dr. Carl Baugh uh, met him, went on digs with him. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Science and the Bible are synonymous with knowledge is what it means. And repeatable, observable and repeatable. The thing is, evolution is nothing that, according to evolution, nothing blew up and created order. That's against the second law of thermodynamics. And they say, well, that's just your opinion. Okay, that's physics. Okay. I don't have to be a rocket scientist to realize that how silly that sounds. Okay, secondary, guard your children. Um, in our, 
as a nation, I'm not talking about local, I'm talking about our nation. I'm kind of sheltered in my area because, you know, I've got a, a fairly conservative area. But nationally, if you're listening to this and your children are going to a, a school that's 90% of our t kids are, are in public education, uh, I have to say, if you can afford or uh, homeschool your kids, do it. Um, if not, then at least when you bring them home is to see what they've learned. Get in, get, find out what your kids have in their homework. Find out what they're learning. Don't be just lazy and say, well, we trust the school, no matter what school it is, good, bad, no matter which part of the state you're in or, or states, because they're teaching our kids not only the evolution, but they're also teaching our kids about uh, sexuality at a very young age, three to five. And it just got knocked down in uh, Governor Santos. If, God bless you. He was able to divert where the bill was kind of come through to be able to teach three to five year olds who know nothing about colors and their into uh, homosexuality and into different things, which we know is pedophilia. Um, and because these children don't know anything about anything and they'll listen to whatever you tell them. They're bringing uh, into schools and some of the northern states are actually bringing these people that believe in this, that dress up as, you know, God says for a man to dress up as a woman is an abomination or vice versa. He says, that, that's what he says. And I know I'm making lots of friends or influencing and winning friends, but I am more afraid of offending God than I am offend, of offending people. The thing is, uh, I feel like we've been too quiet. Christian, we are to pray, we are to teach our kids, and we're to stand up and say enough. That doesn't mean going up and start burning buildings down and everything. No, no, no. We are to, not only in our votes, but to be verbal. It starts in the home, husbands, dads. Starts in the home to train your kids. It's your responsibility. You're saying, well, I just don't believe that. Well, you'll be held responsible for it. And who's going to teach your child about this world? You or the, the idiot box on the wall or the universities? I'll tell you right now, you, you do any 10 minutes of research, you'll find that the colleges and the schools, for the most part, are not teaching Christianity. They're, not, they're teaching against it. You've got full-line denominations that are, that are ordaining uh, you know, uh, drag queens as pastors, uh, the Methodist church, not all of it. Now they split. I have a friend who is an Anglican and he went with a conservative diocese through Africa because they couldn't find one here in our own country because the one that was, I believe it's out of Dallas or San Antonio, is liberal and is bringing this in. Okay. And the people are... Because it's different now. And God very clearly said, for this reason I created them male and female. And a man shall leave his mother and his father, and he shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. That means no polygamy. That means one man, one woman, even though we see in our Bible where some of the famous ones didn't do that. But God said one man, one woman for life. And he said, this is what I'll accept, and this is what I won't accept. Why I'm on this is because right now our children are under attack. Our homes, we have this stuff coming into our houses through the TV, coming into our houses through the Internet. Is there anything wrong with the television if you're guarding it? No. Enjoy a good movie. Or is the Internet a good, positive thing if used correctly? Yeah, just like a, just like a weapon. A weapon's good if you're going out hunting or defending your life, or it can be used for a crime. Same thing. But who's in control of that? You or your kids? Are you are you too afraid to to uh, to step in and say something and do something as far as taking care of your kids? Okay. The thing is, the churches are teaching not only that God isn't the only way. Uh, we have, like for instance, we have churches that are full blown supporting uh, non theistic or non creationism. And the Catholic Church is leading the way. Um, the 
some, there's some other churches that are standing up saying, no, this is not science. You know, that, that doesn't make sense. It's completely contrary to science. But if you drill this into the kids' heads enough, they'll believe it. There was a, there was a guy who I can't, I wish I would have printed it out and I could have read it verbatim. He said, we will, raise, we will teach your kids in school. We will teach your youth enough to where you'll be phased out because once we'll, we'll start a new community and you will be phased out with your age and won't matter, and they will accept our understanding, our belief, and become part of our community with what we decide. The author of that is Adolf Hitler. So therefore, look how that worked out. He was able to convince, one person was able to convince an entire country, and look at the devastation that caused. We're talking about the master who is controlling the prince and power of the air. He's in control. He's the prince and power of the air right now, but his time is short and he knows it. And that is our enemy, Lucifer. We serve a God who can created the entire universe. If you're saying, well, you know, he maybe he didn't create everything. He's had to use billions of years. Then your God's too small. The reason this is important, the reason we're going through the book of John, the reason that we're studying this is we know who God is, but he tells us in his word. It's time, it's way past time for us to step up and vote and run for office and to stand up men and women, fight back by voicing godly opinion, educated opinion, educated where you can go in here, realizing that most of the people are going to say, man, I just get out of my face. I don't care what you think. Okay, fine. But don't be guilty of being lazy because you're going to back off and let the, let the evil take over. Yes, we're going home whenever that is. Yes, this place is going to, this, this world that we're in is going to burn. Yes. Yes, it's going to go to literally hell in a handbasket. Yes. But we are commanded to fight it tooth and nail, to hold it off just a little longer. Like salt when you put it on meat. It doesn't keep it from rotting. It just kicks the can down the road. But while that kick can is being kicked down the road, we are able to not only touch our children first, but we're also able to touch other people's lives with the gospel. That's our job. The great commission that Jesus Christ, who is God, said, go and make disciples of all nations, ethnicities, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is a commandment, not a suggestion. And if you say, well, that's just not for me, well, then you're being disobedient to him, God himself. Matthew 28, 19. Read it for yourself. I'll put it up here. Let's go ahead and get started. Yes, I am a little bit... Um, Tired of, of looking every time I turn the TV on, which is less and less. My wife and I turn it on less and less nowadays. Is remember I used a, a really kind of a that's pure water. You can watch good shows. You can watch shows that aren't even Christian, but they but they don't have a lot of garbage in them. Okay, you know cowboys and Indians, whatever you know, you know whatever kind of show, it didn't have all the garbage in it. Don't have to explain that, parents. That's your job to filter your kids' uh, viewing, not just watch whatever they want to. And then, you, or you can take that straw and stick it right in the toilet and suck it right into your brain, into your soul, and think, "Oh, it won't affect me." Okay, let's dig. Let's dive off in God's Word, chapter seventeen, chapter seventeen, John, chapter seventeen. If I'm sorry, if um, if I've, if I've offended you, I don't have it's like me being shy. I don't have that here. Um, but the thing is I do have is that it, to sit back and do nothing is not an option. To sit back and do nothing, anybody can do. To complain, anybody can complain. Oh man, things are going bad. Yeah, just like when you know, you get in traffic and the, and the train stops us here in my local area. That's a kind of a sore spot. And people stop and talk, ask us, hey, I need to get going. Unless you can figure out a way to move that train, we're not going anywhere. 
Well, the thing is, God provides a way through his word. The train is sin and the world trying to stop us from getting to another side to go talk to somebody. God's word says, I'll show you the way. If you all you can do is complain and just say, man, everything's bad and you don't do anything about it, just keep it to yourself. It does no good. Look for the solution. Okay? Verse 17. Uh, if you remember last week when Jesus it was starting to get, he was talking about, he said, my hour has come. I'm getting ready to go to the cross. Okay, this is what we had back when we had Resurrection Day here just not too long ago, a couple weeks back. Now we're getting into the meat of it like I told you we would as far as on his death, burial, and resurrection. Okay? Verse 17, it says, And Jesus spoke the wor these words, lift, lifted up his eyes to heaven, and said, Father, Abba, your hour has come. Wait a minute, we mean your hour. He says, the hour has come. That means he's talking about the cross. Glorify your son, that your son also may glorify you, as you have given him authority. He's talking in the third person. How come? He's talking it because they're all three the same. They're all three separate. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God, all three separate, all three the same. I believe that when Christ was on the cross and he was, he was talking, the Father's lips were moving. That's kind of the way, the, the way that I understand it. But the way he's explaining, he says, the honor is yours, the honor is mine, the hour has come to glorify you by dying for the sins of the world and me glorifying me, okay? It says, verse 2, it says, as you have given him that's Jesus, authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. In other words, the Father, remember, Jesus is God. He's equal to the Father and the Holy Spirit is God and he's equal to the Son and the Father, but they all have jobs. The Son is subject to the Father and the Holy Spirit is subject to the Son and the Father. Just like in a marriage, the wife is so you don't go and say, "Well, I'm better." Mm -mm, mm -mm. That's completely against Scripture. The way God set up the, the family unit is the reason that Satan hates it and has been trying to destroy it since Adam and Eve, and he's done a really bang up job. Uh, and we help him a lot. The husband and wife are equal in the eyes of God, but they both have jobs. They both have positions. They both have responsibilities. They're both equally important, okay? The son, this is what he's talking about. See, how remember here it says, it says, he had authority over all flesh that he should give eternal life, to give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is eternal life that you may know, that, that they may know you, in other words, the Father, the only true God and Jesus Christ. Hold your spot there. You remember uh, John 10? You, you don't have to go there if you don't want to. John 10, 28. I'll put it on here when I edit this. You'll have it sometime before Sunday. 10, 28. He says, you get, he says the Father gives eternal life and he gives eternal life. You remember where Jesus says, these are my sheep and my sheep hear my voice. And he said, I'll start off in verse 26. It says, but you... Do not believe because you are not my sheep. He's talking about the unbelievers. As I have said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. This is talking about Jesus. And I give them eternal life, that they may never perish. And that's a lake of fire. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. For I and the Father are, the Father are one. Okay, go back, go back. He's just reiterating. This is explaining who Jesus is, who the Father is, and how to get saved. John is explaining who God is in the Trinity, and also how to, how to get saved. This is the main part. This is the crux of the of the entire book. Okay. Verse 4, I have glorified you. That's Jesus has glorified you, the Father, on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. This is before the cross. He's speaking as if it's already done because in his mind, in the way God is, it is. He's in the past, present, and future. But he already knows that this is completed and it's getting ready to finish it. He said the work, in other words, the evangelization of 
of Israel, trying to get the Jew first and then the Greek. He said, I've already finished this work, but it's not completed yet because I hadn't gone on the cross. Okay. Verse 5, it says, Now, and now, O Father, glorify me together with yourself. Glorify me, Jesus, and glorify you, Father. To, at the same time, he's, only God can do this. If it wouldn't, if he wouldn't God, it'd be real arrogant and be blasphemy. He says, and glorify me. Which verse am I in? I can't believe which one. Uh, oh, Father, glor yeah, glorify me and glorify yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Oh, we mean before the world was. Okay, remember, the Father, the Son, and the, and the Holy Spirit are co-eternal. And they're, uh, they're, etern they're, they're eternal. Eternity past to eternity future. The Psalm 90 verse 2 says, I'm the same yesterday to tomorrow and tomorrow. But he says, I am for e I'm the same everlasting to everlasting from eternity past to eternity future. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were in perfect harmony with each other for eternity past. They didn't create us because they were lonely. Really? Or that they needed some help or somebody to rule. They did it because out of love. And they created us so we could worship him. But it's a choice. It's a choice. And billions, most of the planet won't. Most of the planet won't be there. This is kind of a harsh saying. Most of the planet won't be in heaven. Not everybody's going to heaven who's a good person. That's incorrect. I don't care what uh, the Pope says, who doesn't claim Jesus is the only way, who bows to an image. Not just him. He's not the only one. Not the only religion. You're saying, well, you know, who am I supposed to believe? Well, you can either read this or you can believe a religion. I don't care what it is. What, what, put whatever name on it. Verse 6, I have manifested your name, Christ manifested the name of the Father, to the men whom you have given me out of the world, his disciples. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. Everything that Christ, when he was referring, when he's talking to the disciples and to the people who are listening, he said, all this comes from the Father. The authority comes to me from the Father. Christ is God. But the Father still delegates authority. Okay, so if Christ will submit himself to the Father's authority, who are we to say we're not going to submit ourselves to the authorities of our boss, of our government, of our, if you're, if you're married, uh, wife to the husband, to children, to the parents, to, you know, the time that you do not submit yourself to authority is when it violates God's scripture. Like, for instance, these, these countries like China and North Korea and the other uh, dictatorships, in communism, they say if you pray to any other god other than the government, then we're going to kill you. Well, you, you yeah, obviously you, you you don't submit that. You be, you be a good citizen, but you don't submit to that because then you're going to God's authority and not theirs. Um, so that's Romans chapter 13 is where you're looking for that right now. Some of them say, well, you better admit to the. They tell us not to pray. They tell us not to worship God, but to worship. That's uh, because God is the greater authority. God's authority is over that. We are to obey our government. We are to obey our authority, even if we don't like it. If they come up to you and they say, well, I want you to do this job, or you got to obey this law, and it's not against God's scripture, and you don't like it, you still got to follow it. Because that's being obedient to God while you're being obedient to your government. When the government turns against God and, make, and tells you you can't worship and you can't do what's according to his word, that's when you, you peaceably disagree and, and, and not obey. That that won't uh, cause any problems for, for us, will it? Yeah. Again, you've got to choose. Who are you going to offend and disobey? People or God? Are people going to be there at the judgment seat when you're talking to him and say, why did you, why didn't you, well, I didn't want to offend, you know, those, these other people. I didn't want to tell them that what they were doing was sin. I didn't want to tell them because I, I didn't want to rock the way. It's not my position. He said, but I put you there to tell them the truth so that maybe they'd be delivered out of the out of the bondage, out of the sin, out of the cancer of sin, and you failed. Or do you want to 
would you rather offend the people in love? Don't go up there and go, eh, you know, you know, beating them over the head with the Bible. All that'll do is drive, that'll, that'll work, driving them away from the church, driving them away from God's word. Yeah, you do it out of love. Get educated. Get the facts because they're there. Verse 8, for I have given, given to them the words which you have given me. This is Jesus giving the words from the Father. And they have received them and have known surely that I came forth from you. In other words, Christ came from God, the Father. And they have believed that you sent me. Verse 9, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. Whoa, pay attention. I do not. This is Christ speaking. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. What does that mean? I do not pray for the world. Is the world a chunk of dirt? You got the pagans worshiping in this chunk of dirt? Uh, no, it's talking about the people who are lost. Now, Jesus did pray saying he knew in eternity past who, who would and who would not accept him as what he's done on the cross and as Savior. Okay? He even talks about how he, he uh, knows that people in the future that aren't present there still belong to him. God knew in eternity past who would and who would not accept. Okay? But those who rejected, he said, I don't pray for them. This is one place. It says, I do not pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those who you've given me. I pray for the ones who are going to come to me, who already, who already, he already knows who they are before they do. So like the Pharisees that hated his guts and those that rejected him and didn't want anything to do with him, he said, I don't pray for them. That's Jesus, who is God. He said, I'm not going to pray for you. So therefore, yeah, because you're just a good person, that doesn't line up with this. Verse 10, and all mine are yours. In other words, all that are Jesus' are the Father's. So he says, all and all mine are yours, and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. In them, I am glorified. In other words, when they do what God says, he follows the commandments of Christ. He says, if you love me, you'll, you'll, you'll follow my commandments. It's not being a good person, having to go do all this stuff. To go ahead and do stuff like, oh, we don't give money on the Sabbath. We don't, uh, we don't work on this. We don't, you know, and you start naming off these rules. And you're thinking that makes you spiritual? No. Now, the commandments are to follow Christ, to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's a commandment. Okay? To gather together with like Christians, he says to do that. Okay, read it. He tells you what these commandments are. He tells you. You don't have to ask, you don't have to ask somebody. Read it. Okay. Verse 11. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. He's still standing here. How does he say that? I'm not in the world. In other words, he's already looking past the cross. His job, he's getting ready to be taken. Okay? We're getting ready to go see this over in verse 18 or chapter 18 where it starts to get nasty. He's saying he's already finished his earthly ministry. Now he's getting ready to go to the cross to take care of, of the day of atonement, the pain for the sins of the world. Then he says, Tetelestai, it's finished. It is finished. That was his last words. And then he released his own soul. Okay. Here's a point of contention. Spoiler alert, this is going to make somebody mad. Holy Father, and this is Jesus talking. He says, Holy Father, keep them through your keep them through your name, those whom you have given to me. Jesus calls the Father, God the Father, Holy Father. That is the only time in the only time in the scriptures you see a, that you only Jesus calls somebody Holy Father. We have different religions, not just one. There's more. And they call their priest or their head Holy Father. That's blasphemy, because Christ calls God the Father Holy Father. He says, "Do not call people Rabbi, and do not call them Father." 
Is he talking about your priest out here? No, that's not what he's talking about. The title, you can still use the title, or you can say Rabbi Smith, or you know, whatever. That's not what. That's not the context. But it's talking about elevating them further than being a teacher. And he's saying here, when he calls God the Father, he says, "Holy Father." To call a human being a Holy Father is saying that you're on the same level as the as the Son of God. That stay away from, step away from, because a lot in, you know, only in Jesus is the one who says Holy Father. You don't see anybody else. He calls him Holy Father. They don't call it. They never call a human being Holy Father ever in the scripture. That's a religion. It says, you, Holy Father, keep the, keep through your name those who you have given to me that they may be one as we are one. While I was with you, with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Again, he's talking about as if he's already gone because, well, actually his God side is already in the, remember, God is in the past, present, and future all at the same time. And he's talking as if it's, this part's already done. And he's already, I mean, he's already ready to go back to the to where his heavenly kingdom is. And so it's kind of you're thinking, why, why does he keep talking in the third person? Why does he keep talking as it as present tense or future tense? He says, "I kept them in your name; those whom you gave to me, I have kept, and none of them was lost except for the son of perdition. Who's the son of perdition?" Which one of the twelve was the son of perdition? No volunteers. Judas Iscariot, son of perdition, the, the, is a is a is a is his name for son of destruction. What is the Antichrist called? One of the names he's called, son of a lawless one, son of perdition. That's who the Antichrist is going to be called. So Christ just called a human being the son of perdition. You got that look on your face. Okay, it'll have it'll have a, it'll have all the, the definition of there, which I'm in the top of my head. I don't have it right now. The son of the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. What he means by fulfilled? That is one of the 355 prophecies that he would be betrayed by one of his own. But now I come to you and these things and these things I speak in the world and they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What is he talking about his joy? He's getting ready to go to the cross and he knows it. He said, my joy, in other words, the forgiveness of sins Knowing where you're going when you die. I mean, come on. No matter how you die, once you're dead, you forgot about it and you're where you at. You're in the eternity of life with Christ. Verse 14. It says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of they are not of the world. Okay, it's not a, this is not a, a confusion. It says the world, that's the people of the world, that the world system that we have right now, matter of fact. Hated them because hated them because they are not of the world. In other words, the people who are set apart, we Christians are set apart. It means we follow a different God. We follow the God. The world follows the God of the Prince of the Power of the Air. So the people who are touting for humanism and I'm not talking about being humanism isn't being kind to your your, your local your your mankind. Yeah, God teaches that better than anything else. He's a God of love, but he's also a God of justice. And they're, they're, they're co-equal with each other. The world is a system of sin. In other words, you can live however you want to. You can have any kind of lifestyle you want. You can do whatever you want, and God's going to be okay with it because he's just a God of love. And he's saying the world, no, that's the world system. Okay? That's what he's saying. And, and to say otherwise is to disagree with what Scripture says. You have to literally throw this out or not read it or butcher it to say that what 
the sin we see over our televisions right now is okay. And he said in these times, if you read Matthew 24, I'll just put one up there. There's three. Um, Mark 13 and Luke 21. Go read them. And um, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 5. If you're looking at me and this is the first time you see me doing this, it's because I'm gonna, when I edit this, it'll be up here. If you want to wait until I edit it, it'll probably be no later than Sunday afternoon. It might be sooner. I don't know yet. And the world hated them because they, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, in other words, out of the world system, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Who's the evil one? That is Satan. Satan, everybody says, oh, the devil made me do it. Or oh, Satan's chasing me. Okay, Satan is not omnipresent. He can, he's like us. He can only be in one place at one time. Of course, he can get there a lot quicker than us. Yes. He can't be in two places at once. So the devil's not after you. Okay? Now, if you're a high-ranking official, like a, I don't know, maybe a U.S. president or something, or something like that, yeah, he might be interested. Okay, but the he's only interested in people with power that can get the most damage done. Okay, it says he has to, he didn't take it away from us, but that we he brings us through it. Sometimes when we're we're going through, we pray, oh Lord, take this away from me. Whether you're sick or whether you're going through hardship, your prayer shouldn't be, hey, take this take this away. I need I, I got to get out of this. Pray and ask God if it's your will. Don't take me out of it, but bring me through it and teach me what I need to learn because he may be teaching you and training you for the next test. But if he took it away too soon, you wouldn't learn anything. And only he knows what that is. Okay? That's what, and that's what Jesus is saying. Verse 16. They are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them with your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. In other words, God brought Christ physically in the world. Christ is sending the, 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 the believers out into the world of people with a world system to teach the gospel. Not, not, not rocket science. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may also be sanctified by the truth. Verse 20. I do not pray for, those, for these alone. Here we go. Get ready for it. He said, where are we at? But also for those who will believe, will believe, future tense, in me through their word. What does that mean? We're reading it. Jesus didn't write anything down. He told them, the Holy Spirit gave the men the words to remembrance. John chapter uh, 14, 26. 14, 26. And he said, I gave them the words and then they take it out and spread it and then the future generations will be able to read it because what they wrote down. Uh, it's this. It's in my hand right now, in your hands. Let me read it again. I do not pray that you, that you would, that you, I do not pray for these alone, but also those who will believe in me through their word that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I am in you that they may also may be one in us. Plural, Pl or dual. Remember, if, God, if, there is no, if there is no Trinity, then why does Christ, who is God, using plural, dual, and plural, and sing singular, dual, and plural? He says in us, there's only one God. But there, the Trinity, this, again, this makes common sense if you, if you don't understand the Trinity that the world may believe that you sent me and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, prepositional phrase inside, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may be may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, 
I desire that they also, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given to me. Christ has tooted his own horn. Otherwise, that would be arrogance if it was one of us. He's saying they may be where I'm at. Remember what Christ said when he was talking about the rapture? He said, I go to prepare a place for you. Remember, we just read about it a couple weeks ago. He said, where I go to prepare, I go to prepare a place for you. Matter of fact, I read it last week. I think I did. I go to prepare a place. I, I go to prepare a place to, to uh, for in another, another translation or another uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It says, I go to prepare a place for you, or my, there's many rooms in my father's house, and I go to prepare a place, and, and I will come and I will get you and bring you to where I am at currently. For if, I, if this wasn't so, I would have told you. In other words, it also says uh, the exact same thing. It says, I go to prepare a mansion for you in my father's house. In other words, rooms, mansions, we, you get the concept. My father's house, which is the throne room of God in the third heaven, the he says, I go to prepare a mansion for you, a room for you, a place to live. And when it's done, I'll come get you at the right time. And then I'll bring you to where I am at. That means that can't be the second coming. Think about it. He says, if I come to get you and bring you and take you to where I'm at, he's not going to be at the, he's not going to be on the Mount of Olives like it says in uh, Zechariah chapter 14 and at the end of Revelation where he comes down on the Mount of Olives and comes and sets up his rule and reign for a thousand years. Because why? Think about this. Where are we when he comes down, when he comes down to rule and reign? We're following him. Those, the, the bride is following him. Okay. That means we had to come from where? From wherever he was. We were with him. He says, I'll come get you and bring you where I'm at. He's not saying, I'm going to bring you where I'm going, I'll be later. He's where I'm at currently. And then he's going to, after seven years, after the seven year tribulation, then he's, we're going to go with him and come back to the earth and rule and reign for a thousand years. So we have to go to be able to come back. Not rocket science. Let me see how many more people I can offend. You read this again, verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. Again, he's talking future tense. Remember, he's been speaking. How many times did he speak future tense on here? He's speaking as if it's already over. Same context. And they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Remember in John chapter 1, verse um, 3, where he said, oh, oh, excuse me, John chapter 1, verse 2, it says, well, the first one, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and he was with God from the beginning. And all things were made were made by him, and there was nothing made that was made by him. And then he goes down to verse 14, and it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt amongst men. That's Jesus Christ. He says, I was, with, I was with you, Father, before the foundation of the earth. God's words. Verse 25. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me. What's he talking about? The world doesn't know you, but I know you. In other words, the ones who are dead are already there. But he says, I know you because he's been with you. He's, he spent an eternity with the Father. He knows him. He says, the world doesn't know you because they don't worship you. And they've, the guys that are still alive haven't seen the Father. But they've seen Jesus. And Jesus and the Father are the same. He says that. Jesus claims that. They tried to rock him to sleep twice for doing that. Verse 26. And I have declared to them your name and will declare it that the love with which you love me may be in them and I in them. So it may your name. He says, I have declared to them your name. Every time we use the word GD or Jesus Christ or OMG, 
oh my, and you use God, you put, you put the God's name in there. It's blasphemy. Christ calls his name. He says, I'm teaching him about your name. The name is holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He says, anybody, he says, if you commit blasphemy, it's using God's name as anything other than reverent. If I say, oh my God, I love you, that's a reverence. But if I use it when I'm talking to my friend and they're already seeing something, oh, wow, look at that, oh my, and they use that term. So well, I don't mean anything by it. It doesn't mean anything. That's the point. God says it does mean something. And you're saying, well, you're just overdoing it. God says, I will not hold you blameless. So shouldn't you, I mean, if you're saying, well, that's no big deal, that means you don't you don't fear the, the danger. God says, I will not hold, hold you blameless. Well, read the Ten Commandments. He said, I want anyone who uses my name, who uses blasphemy, I will not hold them innocent. I will not hold them blameless for that. For his name is holy. We don't use our mother's name that way. Why would we use the one who created us? Because think about it. Who hates him more than anybody else on this planet? The one he cast out of heaven. So therefore, yeah, he wants everybody to blast his name because every time somebody uses his name as a cuss word, you know, it's like, yeah. There's... Okay, it says right here, I want to I want to do something real quick. It says, you love me, may be, my, the love which you love me may be in them and I also in them. Go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. Chapter 8, verse 9. While I'm going three, uh, through real quick, I'm gonna, as I'm dragging my finger across, Romans 6, 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death. Wages are something you earn. Death, he's talking about eternal separation from God. When you go to your job and you work, the check they give you isn't a gift, it's a wage. It's what you got, what you, you earned, what you got, wages. That's what sin is. We're getting what we deserve because it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. And that's what he's talking about over here in John. Okay. Chapter 8, Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. This is... Romans chapter 8, verse 9 through 11. It says, But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. If indeed the Holy Spirit, indeed, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. In other words, if he doesn't dwell in you, you've got a problem. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Read this again. There's, he's talking about two separate individuals. But you are not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit. If indeed the, the if indeed if the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't he, he is not his. In other words, he said the Spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, it's the separate, the first, or the second and the third of the Trinity. Verse 10. And if Christ is in you, prepositional phrase again, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. Notice that spirit is capitalized. But if the spirit of him, that's the Holy Spirit, who raised Jesus from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead? Jesus says, I raised myself. God the Father says five times I raised him, and the Holy Spirit says he raised him. Here's one of the places. It says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Okay, it tells us where Jesus is and where the Holy Spirit is. And if it's, if Jesus is in God the Father, and God the Father is in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit indwelled Jesus because he led Jesus out into the wilderness, do the math. That means the Spirit of God indwells every believer. That is the entire Trinity. Because the Holy Spirit indwells you. The Holy Spirit came in and made a place for him, for God, to, your soul, to be indwelt. He tabernacle. He made the, our soul is now the tabernacle of God, just like the temple. The temple of God was physical. Now it's spiritual. It's inside of our soul. The Holy Spirit indwelt, indwelt Christ when He's on this earth. He told Him what to do, and 
Christ we just read says, he says, I am inside the Father and the Father is inside of me and we're inside of each other and we are also inside of the inside of the believers. Holy cow. That means we're being indwelt by God, the Trinity. Yes. Can you explain that? No. Can we explain the Trinity? No. If you can explain God, then you're, you're either you're of another religion. Remember, there's only one God of the Bible. He came to us to die for our sins, for his own creation. Every other religion goes to their own God, even ones that claim to be Christian. There's some that say that they'll be their own gods. Uh, if they're good enough, they commit enough, they create enough acts, that they'll be and go have be gods of their own galaxies. Uh, this is the Mormon religion. Uh, then you have the Jehovah's Witnesses. You have, um, they believe a different, they, they all worship a different Jesus. When you're looking at places like Hillsong and uh, you're looking at Bethel and you're looking at the Kenneth Copelands, the Benny Hens, the Joel Osteens, they have a different God. They're worshiping a different God. They're, they're doing everything from, you know, laying on graves. And they, call it, they call it soul, soul sucking or, 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 you know, where they think the Holy Spirit gives them residual. I mean, they teach this. Brian Houston out of Austin earlier does that. Um, grave soaking? No, it's grave. Well, anyway, you can go to the site. You can go on, on YouTube and find it. Brian Houston out of out of Australia. Why is this important? Because Satan has inf Satan didn't get rid of the church. He joined it. And if he can join it, the wolves and sheep clothing are in the pastoral or in the pulpit. If you read the Bible and your pastor is not teaching the Bible, leave. Luckily, I'm, I'm around a bunch of good pastors. How do you know? Well, because I read, every time they read, when they tell me out of the pulpit what they're saying, I'm reading it and looking at it and, and saying, wait, is this what it really says? I'm asking the Holy Spirit to give you understanding. If you may not understand something, that doesn't mean you're wrong. It means you may not understand because you just don't have the knowledge. Well, then go find out. Either talk to the, an elder or the pastor and say, please explain this because I'm having a hard time. And then when the explanation gives you, go research it. It's not like your soul depends on it. Yes, it does. Now, sal you have salvation, and then you have eternity. Then if you're saved, you're working to serve Christ for the rest of your life, which builds up gold, silver, and precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Read it for yourself. It's going to be... 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. What that is, is what did you do to serve yourself and what did you do to serve Christ? If you'll look at the news, look how they're getting us all, in our, even in our own country where we used to be a nation, now we're going to globalism. Why is that important? Let me go, let me, let me explain that real quick. Globalism, first of all, the United States not, is not mentioned in Scripture. Some people would disagree with that. They say, oh, it's a prophetical Babylon. You can't prove that. There's, it, doesn't, it doesn't say here. It could be a world system. It could be because either we're no longer in the game because what we'd like to think is there's so many Christians here that we're, during the rapture happens, we're all of a sudden go from 320 million down to a small nation and barely keep track of what we're doing or because we're destroyed or because we're part of the world system, which that's what I lean to, that we're going to be one of the 10 governments because the Revelation says there's 10, 10 governments. Three are, three are hit, and there's seven that take over uh, by the dragon, by the beast. And we'll just, we maybe just fold it in with the rest of them because we're no longer a consequence, and we're, they purposely gave us weak uh, government so that people are fed up and that, Everything just kind of comes to shambles and we fall in line because if you'll listen, listen for the words, three words, new world order. I'll put it up here, new world order. This is a one world government. This has been talking about it since Genesis with Nimrod. When Nimrod tried to have a one world government, a one world religion, a one world language. And God said, let us go down and confuse their language and spread them out. Okay, Satan's been after that since then. Well, he's going to get his wish. 
for seven years. So, that's going to happen. We don't know when. It could be today. It could be 20 years. And you're saying, well, that's doom and gloom. If your house was on fire, would you rather be saying, you know, don't worry about it. It probably won't get to you for a while. Or tell you, hey, your house is on fire. Do something about it. Get prepared. How do you get prepared? Do you go out and sort beans and bullets and hide in a shelter? No. Do you do, you do a little prepping and have extra stuff so if we're not raptured out for 10 years and everything starts falling apart, you have a little extra money, which you're going to get rid of. Uh, it's going to be not crypto. It's going to be digital money so they can keep track of every dime and then control what you do or don't buy. Hmm. Let's talk about in Revelation with the Mark of the Beast. Is have a little extra. Have an extra medication. Have a little extra food. Have an extra water. You know where you can get one. So in case the natural disasters start happening and things get rocky before we go home, and even if we, you got it and nothing ever happens and we get raptured out, then you're going to leave all that stuff for somebody's left behind. And then God can supernaturally lead them to them. That's just my way of thinking. That's the way I like to think about it. Is it in the Bible says he's going to leave it for other people? No, he says he will provide for those believers. Most of them are going to have their head cut off. But what we see, if you're looking at the news, you're seeing, they're not even telling us a majority of what's going on. We've got friends that are actually on the ground over in Europe right now fighting. Actually, they're doing humanitarian. I won't say their names because I don't want to put them in, in danger because they're going places that are not friendly. They're Christians who felt led to go and they speak the language and they're there. And we've been praying for them. I hope they come back. But anyway, you look on the news, the disasters, all the stuff going on, you shouldn't make you scared. If you're a Christian, if you're truly saved, we're waiting to go home. This place is going to burn in a thousand years. Christ is going to, God's going to redo it after a thousand year reign. During the tribulation, it's going to be hell on earth, literally. Well, how do you keep from doing that? If you want to avoid all that garbage, all that tribulation, the wrath, the bride of Christ is not going through the wrath, the tribulation. We don't know when the, the, the rapture is going to happen. We don't know the hour of the day. If you're in the tribulation, when they sign the peace agreement with the many, Daniel 9, 27, then he says in Daniel 9, 27, how many days from the time they sign it, seven years to the day, Zechariah chapter 14, he's going to say, where, the Mount of Olives, when, in the evening, and the season is going to be warm. So if you're in the tribulation, you're going to know the day, the hour, the location, and the season of where exactly where Christ is going to show up and come down and put foot. Matthew, Mark, and Luke said we won't know the hour of the day. It also says we don't know when the signing of the peace agreement is going to be. The only way that the only way that comes into effect is if we're we don't know when the rapture is, we're going to be gone. But the people who are here left afterwards, who watched the signing of the peace agreement, are going to know. So you're going to be looking forward. So that can't apply to you, to someone who's in the tribulation. Because you're going to know that exact information because the Bible tells us. You don't know when the rapture is going to happen, but if you're in the tribulation, you're going to know when it's going to end. So Christ, the rapture is not the second coming. The second coming is the second coming. When we leave from the, the marriage supper of the Lamb and come to earth. A video I'd like for you to see, if you don't mind, it's on YouTube. It's free. It's called The Galilean Wedding. It's an hour and six minutes long. It's well worth it. It explains it. it has Kevin Sorbo is the narrator. Um, tell you what I'll do is if I can, I'll put a picture up here. I'll, I think it's still shot. Put it up here. And go see that. It's, it's, it's free. Go look at it. And it, it explains really well on the rapture and why this and it's, I won't, I won't, spoiler alert, we win. Um, we go home. So anyway, how do you avoid all this? The, re, the way you avoid this is to not be here when the rapture, or to be here, after, not to be here after the rapture occurs. That means you've been taken. Repent. We've all sinned against the holy God. And God says in Revelation, he said, no, no sin will enter into my kingdom. No unrighteousness will enter into my kingdom. That means you have to be forgiven of your sins. If you're dying for your own sins, you can't be good enough to forgive without one sin of your own. 
no purgatory. You can't die and pay for any of your own sin, according to what Christ said. Hebrews 9.27 says it's once for someone to die, and then there's judgment. Repent. Go to the Holy God, the Holy Father, not the one in Rome, but the one in heaven. That's the only Holy Father there is in the universe. According to him, we just read it. To accept that Christ, who is God, came to earth and lived a sinless life, was tempted in all areas, went to a cross he didn't deserve to die for sins he never committed. For us, for his creation, because Christ is the creator, his own words. And that he bled, shed his blood, because there's no forgiveness of sins except through the shedding of blood. Here's the verse, and I'll put it up there when I edit it. Read it for yourself. And through the shedding of God's blood is the only thing that forgave the sins. He became an atoning sacrifice for us, forgiving us of every sin we've ever committed. He died for all sin, the every sin ever committed in the entire planet from every human being. You say, oh, that means everybody's saved then. Anyone who, oops, sorry. Anyone who would accept him. He forgave every sin ever committed. It's like having medicine for a, a disease for everybody on the planet, which is a cancerous sin. And they created enough doses for every human being that's ever lived. Say, all you got to do is come pick one up and take it. There's however many billion doses here. All you got to do is take one dose and it's good for life. Most people will not, they may believe in it or disbelieve in it or, or hate it or whatever, but only those that come in and take that will be saved. He died for all the sins, but we have a choice of whether we want to accept it or not. That's our choice, free to us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says you can't earn your salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, but it's a gift of Christ, of God. He died for us and paid the price. And he died, went to the grave, rose three days later, and then after 40 days, he ascended to the Father. You want to know why 40 days? It's because he stayed here to, to prove who he was. When he resurrected, guess what? When Christ resurrected, <laughs> people that were believers that were buried came, got up out of their graves, by, it just says a lot, and came back home. That means people who had a whole Uncle Tom or George or Susie or whatever who was buried a month earlier or whatever, some of them showed back up at the front door and, and said, hey, I'm, I'm okay, I'm fine, I'm uh, recovered. Because <laughs> his power was so great that he's, he allowed this to happen to be a witness, evidence, proof, not blind faith. He said, I did this for you. I don't believe in altar calls. Read the book of John. Read the book of Romans. Realize that the God we serve is the one who died for our sins. Next week, we'll be on, on chapter 18. If you have any questions, you can contact us on pray5.org. It'll be at the end of this video or Alito, uh, or excuse me, the Daily Christian Talk, which you're on. Or you can go to my YouTube, and it's under, and I'll put it here, Cop for Christ, the number seven. That's lowercase C-O-P-F-O-R, uppercase C for Christ, H-R-I-S-T, and then number seven on the YouTube channel. I just started getting into that, and it's just in its infancy. Contact us if you want. If you don't have a Bible, we'll send to you, one to you for free with no obligation unless you want to speak to us. This is Scott from Pray5.org and the Daily Christian Talk on here on Facebook. Don't be lazy. Go out and spread the gospel while there's still time. Start in your house. Pray for your kids. Pray for our schools, our government. Ask, for, pray, ask God for a revival of this nation. And most of all, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for this time together. We ask for your understanding, your wisdom. We ask you to show us what you want us to do to serve Christ and to open or close the doors according to your will on what you want us to do on our decisions. And whatever we do, be to glorify Christ. We ask for the protection for us and our families from evil, physical danger, and sickness. We ask for the healing of our country, to have for a great awakening. We ask that you would uh, protect and bless Israel. 
We ask that you would um, be in our schools, Father, to remove the evil, the lies that are being taught nationwide, and to replace them with true education, true choice, true true understanding of your word and of, of education. We ask that your Bible be brought back into the school like it was for 170 years, to be taught by people who understand it, and to teach truth and to remove the abominations and the perversions and the immorality that's being poured upon our youngest. Stop these people, Father, and touch and heal these kiddos. Make abortion illegal again and bring back traditional marriage of one man, one woman for life. It's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Real quick, I just remembered, I, just, I was looking at the news while I was in here. I didn't, I was looking at Proposition Bill out of California. Yeah, AB2223. I told you that, that there was a vote. It was 11 to 3. Well, it was 11 to 3 with one abstention. And I was looking online. I'm trying to get some more, some more information because I, I still can't believe that this has already passed all the way through, but it passed the other last week. Jack Hibbs from Real Life Ministries was, was there at the Capitol of uh, Sacramento uh, in the in the California Capitol. And I was reading online and I heard from Tom Hughes, which is hope for our hope for our uh, hope for our nation, uh, saying that it passed. What is what is AB two 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 three? That is in California where you can take a twenty eight day old child. They call it a different name. If they give the name of product of conception or blob of cells or whatever, it makes it not so sound human. You can kill the child if it's less than 28 days old. You say there's no way. Look it up. AB2223, California. If the child is 28 days or younger, it's legal. I'm looking to make sure. I mean, I, I can't believe I have. There has to be a mistake. I'm hoping I'm dead wrong that it hadn't passed all the way through, but it showed, I was reading it, it showed that it passed. But yet, if I cut a tree down, they'll freak. We're worshiping the creation. That's Satanism. That's de demonism. That's serving the God of Moloch by sacrificing your own children. I want to apologize for being stern. That's murder. I'll see you later.